Women Matters, the 1st of June, 2020. After a long five-day marathon of the Integral European Conference online, I'm here with the girls to talk about love, about the many forms of love and what we can say about that. So first check-in, as I said, I was on the conference, eight to 12 hours a day. Uh, I'm Heidi Hörnlein from, oh, here's Christine, good, uh, from the Wisdom Factory. And I'm very happy that we did this conference. Uh, I had two sessions, let's say my own, and then I facilitated other five sessions and participated as a, a audience in almost all other things. I think I, I lost one one workshop that was all so <laughs> wow. no it was so great i really loved it so i'm still inspired but actually sitting on my butt in front of the computer is becoming a little bit uh, difficult <laughs> okay i give over to let's say hanali hello ladies wonderful to be here with you again yeah the last two weeks was very interesting for me um we did two mindset webinars and it was just extraordinary with all these people attending as well. And um, yeah, what, what flowed out of that was also beautiful. And moreover, my own journey was one of elated joy and then also deep inner work. So it felt yesterday as if I was shaken and stirred by my soul, it was shaking me up a little bit. And I just did a four and a half hour walk for the first time we ran out, out and um, four and a half, three and a half hour walk at the river. So I just returned to be here in time. So I really feel rejuvenated and ready to, to explore love. Thank you, ladies. Who do you want to, to, to speak next? Let's do Anne. So, good afternoon. Uh, it's absolutely glorious here in Scotland. Uh, we've had three days of really um, continental weather. It's really warm, the wind's mild, and Scotland doesn't get a lot of, you know, we get maybe a six week summer, <laughs> you know, and it often is not that warm. So it's absolutely glorious. And our lockdown was lifted in Scotland on Friday. And so we went for a socially distanced walk with our daughter and granddaughter. And that was on Friday. And then on Saturday, we went for a socially distanced walk with our, my daughter-in-law and her partner and Noah, who's two. And then yesterday, my daughter and her husband came over and we had another socially distanced walk uh, down by the river, which was absolutely glorious. And one of the wonderful things that has happened because of lockdown is we found walks from our front door and we found probably half a dozen walks into the forest down by the local rivers that we probably wouldn't have come across from our doorstep we'd have probably driven so uh, yeah I'm feeling very much in love with with nature today so that that's my loving place the love of being with uh, what we call the four daughters of beauty in my tradition the the fire the spirit of the sun fire uh, being with the earth being with the water and being with the, the air so um, and when i was listening to dr zach bush recently he said do you want to protect yourself from covid just go and be with the elementals and i thought that was really a lovely simple thing to do is just to be outdoors. So I'm ready for a call today. I'm complete. So Christine or Monia? Monia. Okay. Well, we had Scottish weather in Vienna. It was cold and uh, windy and chilly. Uh, but today we have finally sunshine and I'm tending to my flowers on the balcony 
they are very, very yeah, eager to bloom. And I have some that don't open when the sun doesn't shine. So today they finally opened again and that it's, it's a kind of yellowish flower and that was just amazing. So I said, well, the weather will stay. I have been very remote for the last few days. Another acquaintance of ours died. And so I am just going into silence most of the time. And that helps. And yeah, I wonder if I'm ready to talk about love, but we'll see. Maybe you inspire me. <laughs> and Christine? Good morning. Um, it's morning, so it's early for me, and um, I love coffee. <laughs> uh, it's been a, a busy past few days with IEC, a lot of time sitting and watching the computer screen and uh, seeing my reflection come back. Um, but it was very inspiring uh, to listen to everybody and um, I was struck by um, uh, Lorraine in South Africa. I mean, Heidi uh, hosted that talk and, and that was very lovely. Um, talks on forgiveness um, and really just people opening up. And that's always uh, very moving when you see people uh, willing and uh, coming to something uh, um, so willing to be open and sharing. Um, so I guess I'm trying to carry that forward and continue to be mindful, keep that mindset, uh, as I start my work week and get back into my usual routine, um, and, and just try to be present. I, I, uh, do therapy with people. So, you know, I, I try to be present obviously anyway but um, trying even more so. Uh, I think the challenge will be um, doing things so much with the computer and not in person is starting to become evident to me that that gap is there. And initially it was okay to try the technology and it was helpful. And now over time, you know, the, the difficulty of using it is more apparent, but um, trying to close that gap possibly with feelings of love or, or be more loving and more open. Yeah, thank you. What I find so astonishing that uh, you can even uh, establish this feeling of love when you are in a small group of int intimacy. If that's the same as love, we can talk about that later. And yes, maybe that's meant that we explore these ways of uh, being together on, online, only to know that there is a difference um, with being together. I would say both has its advantages and its disadvantages. And we could now explore how it is when we are online. It has definitely some advantages. I have the feeling that um, as you see only the faces and people pop up in the breakout rooms and so on, this intimacy can be there, but then uh, it's a little bit like Tom talks about it. There is no history and no future with them. Maybe you don't see them again. On the conference itself, you might see the people again and uh, talk with them, you know. And here, that's just by chance if you see them again, if you are assigned to the same breakout room. So uh, it's in some way even easier to establish intimacy, I think. Uh, and. That it is possible is fascinating. But what I felt yesterday after it was finished, I was full, but you know, after a real conference, then you go to the airport and go home and takes a quite a time. And there is more excitement of having lived these, these times, you know? And while here you go back into your normal thing. So yeah, it's done, hmm, finished. So. It was full, but I, I, I felt that there is, even in my after experience, something missing, which is there when we are in person. Mm -hmm. So, 
But that was not the topic. It's just, you know, it's still so near. <laughs> I was there until after midnight yesterday. So, yeah. Well, I, think, I think the the departing is much more poignant when you're doing it in person. You know, you really feel the departure. And, and yeah. you don't when you're saying goodbye online. No. Exactly what I, I said before. People bailed out then of the room and others asked us to stay. And so they just stayed. They didn't want to go away, you know. And so they decided to leave the room open for the hour or so. To that. And somebody, the, the guy who, who played the music at the end, the young Mexican guy, I think, he took his guitar again and played music. And it was a spontaneous thing, which was also nice to experience that it is possible, you know, 60 people uh, with, with open mics and come together in this way, that's great. Anyway, I loved to be with these people. <laughs> is this love? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about, about love. I mean, intimate love with people, with other person, we, we, we know that sort of everybody of us. What, what, what other loves do we know? And what is the difference or the characteristics? And you talked about love as grandparents or, yeah, I think it was grandparents or parents. You like to speak well, to that? Well, I did. Um, I decided when I went back to university after retiring to do grandparenting and the flow of love across the generations. Um, and um, love as a sociological term turned out to be really tricky, really tricky term to research. Um, and where, where I am now is I'm doing a lot of reading at the moment around what's called the cosmic hologram. You know, where do we come from? Um, and there's a wonderful book called The Cosmic Hologram by creation, Information at the Center of Creation. And the, the Brian Swim, uh, you know, um, and Nassim Haramein and the Connected Universe, all of these big things. And basically for me, love is the divine intelligence. Um, my teacher, Rainbow Hawk, used to say, love is the light in human form, you know, so this light energy that pulses from the big breath all the way through to the present time. So we are tapping into something is what I'm learning now. And you can give it labels and you can give it perspectives, um, you know, like grandparenting love or strict love or tough love or romantic love, or friendship love, you know, I found all these terms, um, and intimacy, I think there was a, a lady, Lynn Jamison did a book called Intimacy, which was, was very interesting. And is there a perennial, so my question is, is there a perennial or a you know, like the perennial philosophy we often hear about, where all the traditions are touching into something at their heart that is unchanging. Um, so that, that's what I'm kind of playing. And I certainly, as another piece for me, I certainly know the different energy states I'm in and different love. I know what I'm like as a grandmother. I know that unequivocal kindness and um, tolerance of my grandchildren who are misbehaving or being full of themselves or you know um, or telling me off you know what I love about grandchildren is they like to tell you what to do <laughs> you know, they're bossy and I love that energy where you can just be with them in their bossiness I know what it's like to love my husband and it's a different energy space yeah, so that, that's my laying of the ground to open up our conversation. <laughs> um, I was thinking about how uh, when I feel love and it comes easily, 
that that feels like a more honest and pure love. And Anne, as you were talking about your grandchildren, it's like effortless to to love them. You know, it, it's so automatic and, and easy to do. Whereas other loving other people and certainly probably hardest for me is, is just loving myself. And that uh, <laughs> takes some work. It's not that easy. Um, so I guess I'm struck by, you know, there are different forms of love, but there's also, I guess, different uh, levels of ease with which we can flow in that. Um, and that sometimes uh, it's really a stumbling block and perhaps, you know, I move away from it uh, too quickly because it's not easy. Yeah, it's hard. Can I ask you, um, what does it mean for you to love yourself? Um, be more accepting. Um, uh, be able to see myself more completely, the shadow part you know, the, the imperfections, the, the things that I do that are mistakes. Um, even like, even today I had trouble getting online and I'm probably going to spend the rest of the day criticizing myself <laughs> for something as, as silly as that. But still, I mean, I can imagine, uh, if I don't love myself, I'm going to be replaying that and, and be self-critical. So I think love is just accepting all parts of me, um, the good and the bad. Yeah. And the follow up question, if that is that you think that the whole day you would criticize yourself, how do you then come to the acceptance? Um, I'll probably say, you know, it didn't matter to anybody else as much as it mattered to me. I'll try to put it in some perspective. Um, create the intention to do better next time and learn from it, you know, try not to uh, blame myself, but maybe learn something if I can. Um, and just put it, I guess, in perspective that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, be thrown out of the group or nothing catastrophic is going to happen. So it's okay to, to be me. That's fine. And still, I have a question. How long does it take this process for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that I'm talking about it, maybe it won't take all day. I don't know. Maybe by lunchtime, it'll, <laughs> it'll be done. <laughs> um, probably until the next mistake. Yeah, probably till the next mistake. And then I can revisit it all over again. <laughs> no, seriously, um, probably it depends how much equanimity I have in, in my mind that day. If if uh, I've done my meditation and I'm, uh, I have that equanimity, it might fall away pretty quickly. But if I am ruminating about things in general, if my mind is going, then I can hook onto things. So I think it's almost a, um, an automatic thing that happens with my mind that I'm not always aware of um, how much I, I grab onto things. Thank you. So we can either continue with uh, figuring out what is self-love or what you want to say, uh, Haneli, you haven't spoken yet on Monia to, to the topic of love in general. You are free to do that. <laughs> yes, for me, it's a, um, a, very, a very sensory kinesthetic experience. Um, and like I'm, I've got different there's different um, energies at play, like also with my grandchildren, um, just seeing them is astounding and watching them, how they perceive life and just sensing into how they do that and the joy that comes naturally within them, the, the boundedness. And then wondering when do we stop that? Like when did that really stop in myself? That amazing abundantness and boundedness. Um, then loving others on different levels is for me also very different. It's also, it starts with allowing them to be who they are and not identifying with their behavior. Uh, for me, it's one big part of love. I mean, we speak generally um, of allowing them to be who they are. And if I, if they trigger me to come back into me, what, why am I triggered? Uh, because I'm identifying with something in them 
that brings out something in me. So it comes then goes in internally. And lately I've been working with a phrase that takes me into a loving space without going into judgment because I grew up in a very critical home. So I was working on my, most of my life to <clears throat> come out. I, I didn't want to be like that. So I wanted to do the opposite. But it is to, um, so that criticism, how am I responding to that in myself as well? And then what am I reflecting back to the others? But the phrase that I've been playing with for a few months now is, I'm all that ease. And the moment I say that, it's something happens in me that I look with different eyes and that I hear with different eyes and that I see with different eyes. And for me, that is on what you were speaking about, this force, this universal, something coming through us, which we have no control really over. But if we surrender to it, we hear more and we perceive more and we allow more in others as well. So I think love for me um, is something beautiful. It's something that can really transform our world if we begin to see the love in each other. And I know it's a long journey for, for all of us in humanity to do that, but I truly believe it's possible. That in that state of that, <clears throat> that force coming into whatever you want to call it, that's impossible to hate that. But it is much about understanding. And now you were speaking about Lorraine in South Africa earlier. I just want to link it to how our, our, some of our local cultures perceive love in the workplace. I had a workshop, a uh, leading from the heart workshop once with some leaders. And we were playing with all sorts of aspects of love. And they told me I'll get them all fired because they, they will be um, prosecuted for sexual harassment. Because their association with love is sexual love romantic love. And then we went into the understanding part. It was amazing how they just, they just got it, that we were speaking about something much more than ourselves and accepting and understanding and allowing. I'm complete for now. Yeah, so I'm the last one in this Round. Um, what I got in resonance too is Heidi that you mentioned intimacy uh, with people you just meet on a virtual basis, and so I'm wondering um, if love is the proper word to use in this respect, in this regard. Um, I guess you feel that your heart opens when you talk to people. And this creates the illusion of intimacy. And I, I call it illusion because well, maybe I've been gone too deeply into Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, theories. It's a theory um, that whatever we see and experience, it's an illusion. So, what does that make of love? Uh, to love your grandchildren, that's natural for me too. And I never even think about it and I don't even reflect about it because it's just, they are now in their 20s, 16 and 20s. And there's so much love coming from them. So it's just, uh, I guess it's a reflection of what uh, you experience. And I was particularly touched that my husband for the first time really opened up to a small child because when his own daughters grew up, he was just busy working. And his grandson is, yeah, there is a very, very special tie between them. And that's just delightful. Um, but I would like to go back, maybe this is because this is, will be part of our future for the next weeks or months. Uh, 
the virtual kind of meeting. What is it? What kind of intimacy ex do we experience? Is it intimacy or is it, and uh, one of the aspects of love is uh, self-esteem, self-love. Is this easier on the virtual screen than when you meet people in reality or life? Are we less challenged by the virtual meeting place? What do you think about that? Heidi. <laughs> uh, okay, especially me. Okay. I think it's, uh, we need to talk about what intimacy means. You said it is heart opening. What I realized is that people in a certain setting can say things which they maybe have never said to anybody else about themselves. They can open up. And um, this creates something like a special bond, I would say. Um, what I find good on here on these settings is, you know, I don't have to be ashamed that I might have some kilos more because nobody sees it. <laughs> I don't need to be preoccupied of men looking at me or not looking at me, which is even worse, you know, <laughs> and things like that. All these uh, side things fall away. And so uh, the possibility of, of being more authentic, at least for me, uh, seems to be higher with people I don't know, at least, no, uh, on the internet than in, in person. I don't know if this uh, answers your question. Uh, yes and no. Uh, because uh, I also participated in the We Space Lab of Tom Steininger and I don't know anybody there except Tom. And of course, uh, when you get in resonance, there is some kind of intimacy, but I probably wouldn't recognize the person if I meet him uh, in, li as re in reality. Um, but does intimacy uh, mean that it must be lasting? Isn't it that in the moment? Does it imply that it needs to, to, to be long-term, the word? To me, intimacy, once it's established, it will last. Ah, okay. That's, so, that's my experience, but okay. maybe, maybe you have other experiences. Mm -hmm. What do you think, the other people, about that? Does intimacy need a, a long-term uh, duration or can it just be established or is it only resonance? Christine, you know your, the, the work of Tom is talking about intimacy and coherence and so on. Uh, what is your idea on that? Um, I think like love, intimacy probably has different uh, levels and complexities that perhaps there can be um, immediate intimacy, which to me is letting people see see who you are. You know, if, if you're online and doing an exercise, like at least for that moment, you're letting people see you, the real you. Um, but if you don't see them ever again, I don't think it was an intimacy. It's just different than when you're, you know, have an ongoing relationship with somebody and if you see them every day, you know, to stay in that place. Um, so I think like love, it, it just has different levels and, and different complexities with people. For me, it's intimacy is feel with somebody else. So when they open up, it's to sort of kind of in some way become one with them without um, borders. So I think it doesn't have necessarily a duration for me. It's about the connection that was created initially. It's not a mental thing, it's something else. It's, it happens on another level. So it doesn't need to be spoken about necessarily, 
but you feel it. So when you're with him again, it's, it's, it's unexplainable. There's just some kind of bond, that resonance that you're talking about as well. It's just there. And on a personal intimacy level, opening up to allow others to see parts of you that you normally wouldn't. Because online, like in such a space, it's much easier perhaps when it's personal for whatever reason. But I feel that bond, that feeling with part will always be there, but it will definitely be strengthened the, lot, the more you come together and explore together and share together. Um, and that's just for me. It's, it's just something, it's an unspoken thing that's just there then. And then you listen from another place as well. So you're more, um, maybe more forgiving then and more understanding and more open to whatever the other is sharing. So you're also receiving it in a different place. And I just noticed for myself, my awareness is in a different part of my body when that intimacy, that bond is there. I suppose for me, I'm wondering if resonance is the same as intimacy for me. You know, I, I can resonate with another and feel at ease. But intimacy for me comes from some ground of trust, of r relationship, um, of knowing. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure that... Um, so I can re and and I think the other thing for me is you know I'm I'm an MBTI practitioner you know so and I, I so I'm quite fluent with preferences, and sometimes I find that um, my extroversion, you know, can be a bit of a turn off to someone, you know, because my energy might be pushing in and they might step back or you know their introversion might they're not fully stepping forward and you're you're trying to establish where is the resonance so um and and want and so if i then move to the online space for instance i think uh recording calls reduces intimacy for me because you're then thinking about things are being held there that can be shared without my knowing you know, whereas if I'm having a conversation with someone that's not recorded, there's a different potential for for intimacy um, there. Um, certainly for me, um, I run a lot of online calls um, and I've done a program called um, The Art of Digital Hosting. And the second program was called Sacred Habits. And so really practicing how do you establish resonance you know, so we usually begin with a meditative practice. Uh, we have a shared, we call it stringy of the beads, but certainly some ground of um, seeing each other and knowing what the present condition is of each other um, and having practices where um, we don't ride over discomfort. You know, sometimes you can be in groups where someone is upset um, and taking the time to stop and work with the energy in the moment is harder sometimes online, I think, than if you were in a, a group circle together. So the, the, um, I find that my attention in online calls as well waves in and out sometimes as well. I find it maybe a little bit harder sometimes to maintain my attention Whereas if I'm in the physical presence, I feel like there's something else there that keeps me engaged. And I had a question. Um, you said that intimacy requires trust. And I thought you were implying, therefore, it has to be, you know, it can't be established easily or quickly. It has to have some history as you talked about that. But I, I guess I would ask you, you know, can you trust somebody again, kind of briefly and in the moment? Um, or do you feel when you say trust, is that something that requires history in order to establish that? I think for me, I, I can resonate with someone 
and, and feel at ease with them, whether that's trust for me is maybe a, a different order of um, relationship. Um, and I can certainly resonate with people um, very easily and, and can make the, the, the conscious choice that this person is trustworthy. Um, I think there's just a different order for me of relationship when something is established going forward that in a sense has been tested. I, I don't know if I want to lay that too heavily on it, but yeah. I think we need also to make a distinction about um, who you meet online. If we meet all the time, you know, often we have the possibility to establish trust uh, in the sense um, of long term, because we know each other better, even if it's only online. But in this, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, I was in a circling event, you know, where you talk with uh, people so, uh, uh, to a certain question, and really face to face. And there was a young man who, who said, uh, for instance, that he is very shy normally, and he would never say these things, and he did. So this is a trust which was obviously immediate, you know. On the other hand, he can be quite sure that I even don't remember his name. So if I wanted to tell somebody about it, you know, yeah, I tell it now, but who was it, you know, so I, I couldn't uh, do anything, even if I wanted with this, uh, unless I really want, you know, then I would prepare differently. So this gives also a bit of a freedom, no, to, to the, a certain anonymity in the moment, which can facilitate the opening up and the trust. And I feel it as intimacy. You know, when I open and say, show who I really am. And that was a situation where the boy was the end 20s now, and I'm 40 years older. So that's a situation which normally when we find, try to find our partners for conversations, we normally more or less are in the same age group and find ourselves uh, more comfortable with that. And I, I would have a different approach to younger people when I meet them, for instance, in the conference hall. But in such a situation where you get assigned a, 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 a task and then you get assigned the person, it was easy. So. <laughs> I guess I'm um, aware of Monica's loss of her friend and made me think about love and how it endures um, when people are no longer with us. But the sad part is that the love, you know, is kind of one-sided. It's, it's, we still have love for that person, but we don't feel that love coming back to us because they're no longer there. Um, so we have memories and we have love towards them, but not returned. And um, I'm just kind of wondering, Monica, where you're, where you're at with the love you had for your friend. Uh, well, it's not just one person we have lost in the last six months. It's a couple of persons. And yeah. I don't know how to explain it, but it's not about love not being returned. It's just about that the essence and the energy of that person is all of a sudden gone. It's no longer, except what I remember, that's still there. But, yeah, and Heidi asked me how the birthday party was of that 80th birthday. And you just 
maybe it's just the way I, unfortunately, I can see it in people when they are going to die rather soon. It's a kind of grayish, it's not even a color, but I, it's, I can sense it and I've had that all my life. But now it gets really, it's like all the time. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's about energy. And of course the energy isn't gone. It's still somewhere, but I can touch it. So that's probably what upsets me or makes me unstable or gives me the need to withdraw into myself and just be between two breaths, just being quiet. Um, I wonder if, if <laughs> I've always wanted to believe that love is much stronger than death, but what kind of love is meant in this, in this respect, in this regard? Um, it's not egoic love, it's not passion even. Maybe it's eros as evolutionary drive. Yeah. I'm not very eloquent today, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I can share that uh, I had this conscious aging session on Saturday morning, and I shared a little bit of the history of uh, the Wisdom Factory and the conscious aging series with slides. And I talked about how Mark did the first uh, presentation at the conference and so on. And then I switched over to the next slide where his grave is. And then I burst into tears. I, I it just was stronger than myself, you know? So I don't know if this is love, but as you say, the people are not there anymore to give you back love. I know that, but Sometimes I really do think that this energy is still somewhere around supporting me. Or it has supported me before and I'm still nurtured by that. I don't know what it is, but I was really surprised that after two years I would burst into tears. <laughs> wow. And just sharing that when both you shared Monya and Heidi, what I felt was love. You mirrored it to me, and I still feel it up to my toes. So thank you for that. That for me is love. You are speaking love now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I knew I was there, Heidi, and it was beautifully held. So there was a loving environment around you when uh, that happened. And we took the space uh, not to ride over that. Yes, and Jane uh, answered so, so gently. The, no, she, it was nice, really nice. I appreciate that. And this is also, I felt the love coming from the audience, also by comments and how they were in the space. I think in online spaces, that holding the space, the, lo the loving space, for others is so important that we can then feel comfortable to share whatever it is that we normally wouldn't share in a physical environment that 
being aware that there's something like that. Um, and you can feel it in the presence of people who you're with, but there is something bigger holding it, uh, like a cocoon to keep you safe, so that it's easy for you to share. And I've seen that with men in Turkey as well. They're not used to speaking up about their emotions. And when you just keep a space for them, allowing them just to speak up for the first time, the tears just come and they express their true selves because they know there's no judgment. They don't have to live up to something, to be something, to achieve something or to be good enough. It's just they can share from, where, from the deepest parts of them. So I think we are, when we're in such a space, it's much easier to share. And that's why I think with the online, it's different than the digital, than physical. But both can happen because that specific incident was physical. But in online, it's just more possible for more people to do it. One, one of the things for me, we, in my tradition, we have a wheel. We, we think in wheels, medicine wheels. And we have a wheel called emanating love. You know about M, and, and I, I have this sense of what you were saying, Christine, as well around, you know, when my thoughts take me out of alignment with, uh, you know, the this place of centeredness, whatever you want to call it, source. Some people call it the meridian, um, just that place of unequivocal sort of love. I mean, I've always wondered: is there such a thing as conditional love? You know, can you be conditionally pregnant? <laughs> you're either pregnant or you're not. You're either in loving energy or you're not. You know, so I've always, that's always been a sort of an interesting one for me to. So when someone says it's conditional love, I can feel myself contracting because that's just not my belief structure around love. But what I do play with is if it's sunshine, if I can use the metaphor of love being like sunshine, and that my thoughts that take me out of that as the clouds, can I have a practice whereby I catch what dims and try to find what you were doing, Heidi, with Christine, you know, about can you let the thought go that limits? Can you let the reaction go? You know, it's like my husband, sometimes he speaks to me in a voice that, that irritates me, you know, and I can feel myself saying, don't talk to me, you know, and can I just let it go and ask for something rather than say, you know, and, and that contraction. And then the final piece for me is um, I always love the Esther and Jerry Hicks, Abraham. Have, have you ever listened to Abraham, how she used to speak as him? And there was just one piece so she apparently channels this energy from the spirit realm called Abraham. And it was something about contrast, that we come into this lifetime to experience contrast, what we like and what we don't like. And that really helped me to know that my life condition is to experience contrast. So can I be light and bright with the things I don't like? <laughs> And I try and catch that and be playful with it. Um, I'm not always successful by any means, but, and the more playful I can be with it and the more loving I can be with it, perhaps, you know, and, and certainly all that's happening around the world, I'm, I'm doing a, I'm going to do a course with the Pachamama Institute called the Game Changer Initiative. And you have a precursor course to do and it is giving you all the things that are wrong on the planet to really test your reactions around. And how can I be with inequality? How can I be with? And I'm, I'm right in the midst of that at the moment. And they ask you to recognize how you feel. How can I be loving and respond in a way to gross, huge planetary things? I want to keep learning how to do that. Well, what comes to my mind now is, of course, 
what's happening in the United States. And it spreads like a fire. Uh, of course, we just see short clips of what's happening. And there are always people who are calm and then those that get carried away. And yeah. Hmm. You mentioned uh, contrast which is, of course, what's happening in duality. And if you get to a, they call it higher or whatever, more com, com, more embracing uh, viewpoint or perspective, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, with regard to the United States, it's really, challenging uh, because it, this challenges their system, their political system. And what can they do right now? So it's really tough. It's really tough. And yeah, we just keep watching and this makes us a witness. But yeah, what is the role of a witness? I don't enjoy it very much being a witness. I just, I'm usually the one who is provoking change, yeah, but not just witnessing it. Yeah. What is your perspective on that, Christine? I would be interested as you are living in that country we are talking about. I haven't um, unfortunately paid much attention because I've been spending the past five days at the conference. So I don't even know that much about what is being said in the news. Um, but what Monica said made me think about, you know, where does love fit into a crisis like this? Um, Certainly love is not a topic of conversation uh, with this, but hate is. Um, so I don't know if hate is the opposite of love. Um, hate seems very personal, like it, there's something about the person uh, that is unacceptable and hateful, whereas love, I don't know, I guess I think of love as a broader we certainly can love a person for who they are, but it's it's bigger. It's bigger than hate. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't have a lot to say about it because I really haven't followed it. I'm sure I'll, I'll learn more today as to what's going on. But um, I guess the hate comes out when there's not enough and not enough love there to sustain, you know, caring and to sustain holding people uh, and letting them know that they're important and that they matter, I guess the hate ends up coming in instead. Does anybody think hate is the opposite of love or is it something different? When you were speaking, I had the image that hate is something like a bomb explosion up going up like this and love would be a cover a containment of these things and when the containment is not there then it goes all over the place that just is an image which came to me well uh, as far as i'm informed hate is just the same energy of love as reversed but the opposite of love is indifference as uh, as far as i know so if you really don't care about anybody anymore, then it's the opposite of love. But if you hate, it's, it's, I don't think it's hate, it's just wrath and uh, a lot of anger that's just 
compounded and, and now it's it sort of explodes as Heidi said but it's, but it's not the opposite of love. Anneli? Yeah, it's for me also not the opposite of love. It's two very, two, two very different things. And it's more like your society, love is an all-encompassing um, energy where for me also, Monia, like you, it's the opposite is indifference, but also fear. And I think it's fear that's causing hate subconsciously because of conditioning or whatever it might be. Um, and I'm just referring it back to our own situation in South Africa with apartheid and everything and hating another race, which doesn't make any logical sense. There's no sense in it. And if I feel that energy, I immediately contract. Um, where love is expansive, beautiful energy. It comes from the inside out. With hate, it's something that... I'm still battling to perceive how it can be, especially on such levels, but it's definitely not the opposite of love. It's an expression of deep fear, of not having enough, of not being good enough, of many, many things together. Uh, and it's conditioned. We were not born to hate. Not being seen also can be. Yeah, not being seen and not being... Yeah, appreciate it. there's so many things around it but and yeah and not being given the opportunity to be yourself whereas um, love is allowing everything and accepting but for me it's not the opposite love is not something that you can there is no opposite really for love for me it's the core of our beingness yeah okay and up to you I hear that you have to go soon Yes, I've got another call at half past five and I need to just mm -hmm. go and have some supper with my husband or I'll, <laughs> he'll be shouting at me. <laughs> so thank you, I really enjoyed that today and uh, wish you all well and I take the sunshine with me and the possibility of resonating with intimacy as we move forward. Yeah, thank thank you. you for now. Bye for now. Bye bye. <laughs> I have a mosquito running around here and I always try to <laughs> to defend myself. <laughs> yeah, we can wrap up with a check out, that's fine. So love, hate, intimacy. I think that mosquito loves your blood. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Call that blood, uh, love. <laughs> I don't that's necessarily what? love my salad when I eat it. <laughs> oh, <before that. laughs> but I, what I felt today is intimacy with us all sharing from deep parts of ourselves. And that's something that will stay with me. And I know there's different levels of, for me, there's also different levels of intimacy. And the resonance and connection is a deep part of it. I don't think you can split it apart necessarily. But speaking about the hate, love dynamics also, it's also allowing me to sense into that a little bit more again, because one forget about it. You look outside in like, um, I don't know who said to be the witness, like you, Monia, you said to be the witness. And how do I then re react to that, you know, to whatever I'm witnessing? And moreover, what am I doing about it? Or how am I trying to create, to co-create a better world? So thank you very much, ladies. This, is there's also be going to be some reflection on this beautiful, very broad topic. Thank you, Heidi, for arranging it again. Um, I thank you all for showing up. Uh, Monia, thank you for coming today, even though you felt like being silent and I'm sure uh, it, it wasn't the easiest choice. Um, so I'm gonna spend the day, since it's morning here, uh, I've got the whole day ahead of me to ponder some of these things, uh, try to continue with a, a loving feeling toward myself and my husband and other people I come across today. 
And actually, I think it was, a, for me, a really good way to start uh, my day, and I appreciate it. Um, and we'll look for little holes in the fabric of, of love where, you know, I kind of fall through and uh, get lost and see if I can mend some of those places where there's holes. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. It's always a good decision to join you. And it's particularly the female qualities of listening and sharing and opening up, which I appreciate very much in these groups. Yeah. I hope, Christine, I really hope for your country and for ours as well <laughs> and for Europe and for uh, South America where they have such a hard time right now. So it really, I feel very privileged in my position and it doesn't really help but I appreciate it and I'm grateful for not having to make any of these decisions that others have to make right now. Thank you all. Thank you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I also feel that I'm privileged to, to be living as I'm living and not to be in the slums of South Africa or of Brazil or somewhere. Um, or in the middle of the riots somewhere that I have the possibility to be isolated in, in beauty. What I saw, uh, sense today is something like the you process. We went something like there to pick deep, deep listening and then we came up with, uh, yeah, I don't want to say other perspectives, but other ideas. So it, it, it unfolded the, the conversation and I find it wonderful. And I thank you to be that you come and we are able to practice these things together also with real life questions. <laughs> so have a nice evening and a nice day, Christine, and we meet again in two weeks. Okay. Bye-bye.